joining us on our second episode of the Data Video Tech Quarter. Um, today we're, we're going to cover some uh, topics as a kind of a follow-up to streaming, the initial streaming that we did last time. Um, so I wanted to announce that we created a special email address for, uh, for our, our viewers to basically send us feedback on future episodes. Uh, the email address, which is up on the screen, is techcorner at datavideo.com. So feel free to, uh, <laughs> to send us uh, any comments or, or anything that uh, you, know, you want covered in future episodes that we do. Uh, and we'd also uh, like for you to you know, give us some likes, if possible, on Facebook, and also subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Um, so based on the feedback that we had from the last episode, um, we, we had a lot of users that um, said that they didn't have Facebook, so they, you know, could we do it also on YouTube? So this time we actually are doing a simultaneous uh, stream to not only Facebook, but we're doing it to YouTube. That way we don't leave anybody out. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and do that. And then I wanted to also uh, let you know that uh, we're, we're going to do our, uh, basically a, a tutorial on um, streaming from start to finish with our NVS25 encoder, which is right here. Uh, and so I'll get started with kind of the, the overview, but maybe we can show a graphic of what the overview of, um, of what our test stream would be, of what we're kind of going to give you an example of today. So you see that um, we have basically our, an example of our PTC150 camera, which is a little bit different than the one I'm going to show you here, but uh, it's, it's a pan tilt zoom camera that we would connect to the encoder, it's just an example. And then the encoder will basically connect to your internet source, which would be either your cable modem or router that connects to a cable modem. Um, and then from there, we're going to actually, sh you know, connect to uh, Facebook to show you how uh, we, we do a setup from start to finish. So um, let me show you the back of the encoder. So we bas basically have this is the front, this is the back. Um, so you basically have a the power, we're not going to connect the power, we're just going to show you the actual connect connectors for now. Um, but basically the LAN port is where you would connect to uh, your router, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, we have our inputs to the encoder, they're not outputs, they're all inputs. Uh, and we've got our camera over here, which is just a, a B, our BC80 block camera. And we've got uh, HDMI output, so we're going to go ahead and connect that and I'll show you how it kind of goes together. Just for people that this is very new to them, uh, they might not know what ethernet cables are, they might not know what a LAN port is, they may not know what a, a router is. Um, so we kind of want to start real basic and then we'll kind of go from there. So uh, we've got our ethernet cable, which basically looks like this. Um, this is a short one just as an example. It looks like an old uh, giant telephone jack, if you will. So uh, that's kind of how you can identify the way they look. So we we'll connect it to the back of the encoder. And then I'm going to give you an example of what a router would look like. Some routers look like this. Some of them have antennas. Some of them might be uh, part of a cable modem where you don't actually have a separate router device because maybe that cable modem uh, functions in, in, in two ways where it brings in your your internet connection from your provider, and then it also acts as a router with the wireless uh, connectivity on it. So we're going to go ahead, I'm going to connect it here to one of the LAN ports in it as an example. You wouldn't connect it to the yellow port. The yellow port would, would go to your cable modem, and that's what actually would feed the router. And the router is basically your, your you know, your kind of your traffic uh, manager in and out of your network. It protects you know, uh, outgoing traffic from coming in if you don't want certain you know, access to your network. And it also allows the traffic to go back out of the network. Um, so it's kind of like a little traffic cop, if you will, um, going in and out of, uh, out, of the, out of the local area network to your public side. So this is the example there. And then we would take here, which is basically just an HDMI cable. I'm sure everybody has seen one of these. Um, so we would run the connection from the back of the camera, and then we would that would be an output, and then this would be the input. Sorry, I'm going to go ahead and move this real quick here just so you can see it. All right, so I know 
the cables are a little clunky, but just as an example. Um, so that would be your basic connection aside from power, obviously, that we don't have connected. But um, we're going to do it live with an, another off-camera uh, device that we have already set up on our network. Um, so at this point, I want to go ahead and hand it over to Justin. Um, and Justin is going to give you a step-by-step -step walkthrough. And while he does that walkthrough, I'm going to try to monitor the Facebook uh, comments just to make sure that uh, if there's specific things that you have a question about, um, you can go ahead and, and send us comments through the, the Facebook Live. Um, we also have someone monitoring the YouTube uh, comments as well. Um, so we'll try to get you answers as quickly as possible on there. Uh, so if you do see me kind of looking down, that's actually what I'm doing. I'm kind of just kind of periodically looking at the comments just so we can address those. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to Justin. All right. Everyone ready? <laughs> so uh, first thing you want to do is you're going to want to find the uh, connected MVS25 on the network. Um, so with smaller networks, I would say with most networks in general, you probably want to start with our IP finder tool. So I'm going to take you to Data Video's website. And here you're going to see I go product search for the MVS25 product page. And once I'm there, you're going to see a series of tabs. Go over to downloads. And on downloads, you'll see under firmware, there's the MVS IP finder tool. So when I click on this, uh, we have a general uh, warning about firmware because when you do update units, we want you to do it with uh, uh, some caution. Um, and yeah, so ne never, never before a live event. Please, <laughs> please don't do that. Yes, We've had our, customers do that. <laughs> our firmware was updated well <laughs> before uh, this live stream. Um, and so yeah, once you do that, it'll download the utility, you extract the zip, and this will be just like a cooking show. I'm gonna skip right ahead. And here you can see this is the IP finder on the desktop. Where it says IP address, you have, um, if you have multiple network adapters, say you're running Wi-Fi and a, a wired connection at the same time, you're gonna have two options here. So you're gonna wanna select the one that is connected to the router that also has the MVS25. I'm gonna start a scan. It's going to take a few seconds, and now all of the MVS25s on the particular network are going to show up, as well as some of our other streaming products. So as you can see here at our office, we have three MVS25s going. We have one that is doing the Tech Corner stream that you're watching right now, but um, we're going to play on this one here. And so you can double click, and it will go to the default browser of your choice. Um, that is set on your PC, or you can just take the uh, um, IP address and put it into any browser you want. Once you double click on it or launch it, uh, you're gonna get a pop-up window that's gonna ask for the default username and password, which is, uh, default username is admin, and the default password is six zeros. And you can see up there on the screen, that's the default password information. Um, that's the same as well for our uh, MVD uh, decoders. And once you log in, if you want to change that, you go to the settings tab. Which you should. You should change it. <laughs> and under account setup, you can then enter that information, submit it, and then put in the new one. Also a nice feature if you've got multiple MVSs like we do, um, you can change the device name as well. Uh, another thing you can do is, if you're having issues connecting, and um, if you're having issues connecting, you can uh, do a direct connection via a specific IP. You can uh, check out our support guide on that for more details. Um, and then you can then change the network setup. And uh, with this, you can change it to a static IP that's in the range of your network. Um, usually on larger networks or uh, IT administrated networks, you're going to run into uh, potential issues with uh, the way the network security is set up and they might not just let any new device on without checking it first and opening up um, you know, yeah, they, for it on the network. Yeah, they might have network scanning uh, blocks in place that would not, would not allow that. So um, in that case, yeah, you would have to have your IT personnel be involved at that point. Yeah, I would check with them first before contacting support. And then also uh, on our site, we have a guide 
um, some additional troubleshooting tips if the IP scanner, um, IP finder is not picking it up. And uh, so going back to the uh, MVS25 uh, interface, again under settings, you're gonna have a submenu options along the left here. So the two most important ones here are gonna be your live stream setup. And currently we're on encoder setup. So here on the encoder setup, you're gonna select your source which can also be uh, adjusted using the uh, physical mode button on the front of the unit. And then you're gonna have uh, these options affect the quality of the stream. So um, we have a 720 source being fed into the encoder, so we're not scaling down. Um, we're gonna go with a high profile um, level 4.0. And we discussed this more in detail in our first episode of Tech Corner, so uh, be sure to check that out to get a little more background on what some of these settings mean. Um, the GOP size, I'm going to keep it 60, and bit rate, we're going to do 4 megabit. You can see it's uh, in kilobits here uh, per second. And the video rate mode, we're going to do uh, your choice between constant bit rate and variable bit rate, CBR and VBR. We're going to go with CBR um, because it's going to push more consistent amount of data to the RTMP server for your stream. Um, this is important because if you have, like this image you're looking at right now, when it was the PC and me and the PIP, there was very little motion going on. It's very static. So once motion is introduced, there's kind of like a spike in bandwidth to compensate for that. So if I'm just sitting still like this, uh, there's not too, too much going on. But if I was like shaking around like crazy, then all of a sudden the encoder is going to be, you know, stressed a bit and there might be a, a jump or lost frames in the stream. So CBR helps compensate for that, um, so that there's no surprises for the, uh, you know, for the, the added um, motion, the server. And uh, audio bit rate, um, going back, uh, you can see we're just doing stereo, 128 kilobit. Um, depending on the content, like if you have music, say a worship service where you know music, music is an integral part of it, you're gonna want to maybe increase the audio bit rate to help with the quality. Uh, under audio source, we're using embedded audio from the uh, HDMI source, so we're going to keep it on digital. But you can also use the RCA or XLR inputs to feed your audio board directly to the MVS25 encoder, um, again, depending on your workflow. We then click apply. It'll take about between 15 and 45 seconds to apply the new settings. And then from there, we can go to the live stream setup. Um, here. Anything so, to add, Stephen? Yeah, so basically the live stream setup, once you've configured the encoder setup, it, you, you basically um, adjusted all your settings for the actual stream, but you're actually not streaming yet at that point. Um, the live stream setup is what Justin's going to explain now, is um, basically how you get uh, that stream from your encoder to the CDN, which in this case it is Facebook or it's YouTube or it could be a third party CDN. So. What Justin's basically going to show you in the next step is, one, we're setting up the, the streaming format, which the most common is RTMP, uh, and he's also going to send basically the UR, put the URL information into the encoder so that that way it, it knows, one, where it's pointing and sending that stream to, and two, it's going to have authentication based on a stream key, which Justin will show you. And the authentication uh, basically is it's like a username and password, but it's embedded in a string of, of letters and numbers um, and so forth. So, um, yeah, you can go ahead and continue, Justin. Yeah. Oh, one more thing I want to throw in. Uh, I know we just left the encoder set up, but you may have been wondering, how did I come up with uh, 4 megabit? And uh, basically, Facebook and YouTube and other CDNs will publish guidelines on what uh, they recommend for the bandwidth. Um, and usually going higher than that, it might just be a waste of uh, data on your end. Um, again, you have to we cover upload speed and, and, and bandwidth in our first episode as well and determining what's a good upload speed for streaming. So again, uh, you know, please consider checking out that episode uh, for a little more background on that. But with uh, 720p on YouTube and Facebook, they recommend 4 megabit. Um, YouTube supports 1080 as well. Um, in which case you can do uh, 6 megabit to uh, um, account for the increased uh, resolution. 
So um, we're gonna take you over to the live stream setup on the MVS25. So when we click on the live stream tab, um, you may see that the stream is off. And again, as Steven mentioned, we're gonna do RTMP and we're gonna publish, meaning we're pushing it to the RTMP server um, at the CDN, be it Facebook, YouTube, or another. So we had an old YouTube session uh, in here. Um, now what I wanna do is I'm gonna take you over to our live dashboard. So on your YouTube account, in the top right corner, you kind of have that you know, Google account um, information. You see a button for Creator Studio. And once you click on Creator Studio, it'll take you to the dashboard. And from the dashboard, uh, you see your previous streams and all that. You're gonna wanna click on live streaming on the left. So when I click there, it's gonna take you to the Stream Now page. And you can see that it's offline and I need to put the stream information into the encoder. Now we previously did a YouTube stream on this MVS25, so the server URL, chances are it didn't change. And we'll just quickly confirm that. Yep, it's the same. But the stream key is gonna be different. Now, the reason they hide the stream key is, it, like Steven said, it's a, pretty much a password. So if someone else has your stream key, they can point your encoder to your stream and take it over. Um, so we're gonna have to delete all these once we're done with this live stream. Um, Actually, we had one question, uh, Justin. Yeah, yeah uh, second question. Ricardo Santos was asking, what is the maximum and minimum transmission bit rate on this particular encoder? Or, yeah, I guess in general. So I think it's capped at six. Yeah, it's, it's one megabit to six megabit. I think you can go down to 800 kilobit. But for HD streaming, you're gonna need at least two megabit, realistically, and even then the quality is not gonna be fantastic. So you might wanna consider uh, streaming at a lower resolution, like 720p or even 480, and, and you know, do that to you know, compensate for the amount of uh, data required to transmit your stream. Um, going back to uh, YouTube, um, you can see here encoder setup, uh, just to back up a bit so you, in case you missed it, is when we're in the stream now section, you see it's offline, you scroll down, you get the server URL which hasn't changed from our last YouTube stream. And when you click on the stream name and key to reveal it, you're given the, you're given the key, you copy it, and then you can paste into here. Now this, this stream key will keep, you'll keep having the stream key until you click on reset to change it. So, like, and just like YouTube says, keep it secret. Um, but yeah, if you do, you know, want to uh, occasionally reset it for security reasons, you know, that's definitely recommended. Um, so I put the stream key into there. Um, there's two other fields in this RTMP publish section. There's a RTMP username and RTMP password. Uh, for these two CDNs, they're not used. So, um, you know, sometimes people will mistakenly put in their Facebook or YouTube login information into those, but um, that, that's not what that's for. Um, that's more if you were to do like a authentication for like a private RTMP stream. So uh, leave those blank. I'm gonna click apply and it's gonna take about, you know, 15 to 45 seconds to um, connect to YouTube server. So it will uh, begin the process of pushing the video through and then once it says RTMP published success, I can go back to the uh, YouTube live dashboard and see a preview of the video uh, feed that's coming in. And then I can go live from there. Also uh, with YouTube, you can uh, go to uh, events under stream now and you can stream, uh, you can schedule your live stream to uh, happen uh, later instead of uh, starting it manually. And so that's still going there. So for example, if you were a church or um, you, and you wanted to set up your streams in advance, um, you could configure that in the events so that that way, if you have services at a certain point in time, you can go ahead and schedule that and not have to uh, basically be there to actually set that uh, because it would already be in place and ready to go as soon as the device is uh, is streaming. And one thing I guess we should touch on as well is the auto stream at startup feature. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so with that, um, 
it's not just a matter of starting your scheduled stream. It's also a matter of having your encoder on and streaming to, to that um, live, upcoming live stream. So uh, auto stream at startup will mean when you turn on the MVS 25, you know, it takes about 45 to 60 seconds to boot. And once it's fully booted, um, the RTMP publish settings will kick in and it will push that stream out. So um, if you don't want it to automatically stream when you turn it on, just make sure that that option is disabled. It's disabled by default. Um, but if you want to simply just be able to turn it on and then have the stream going after about a minute, then uh, you know, check that option and then hit apply. So I'm gonna go back to the dashboard real quick and you would see a preview of the live stream being fed um, to, to YouTube and it'll say you're live, how long the stream's been going and then um, you can then control the, the stream and, and end it uh, from there, from the con uh, control panel. Uh, with Facebook, everything's a little bit different. I'm gonna go over Facebook really quick. You see here is basically on your page, you know, your company page or your personal page, uh, where you go to tell them what's on your mind, um, you see a button for live video. And when you click on live video, it will uh, start to um, load the control panel for live streaming, which is, what's Facebook doing? So yeah, something, let's see here. I have to refresh this Facebook page here. Um, so while we're doing that, we, we did also have a, a comment from, from one of our uh, viewers, and he was asking basically what the minimum uh, internet uh, speed would be for 1080i streaming. And actually, that, that is largely dependent, obviously, on uh, bandwidth and the bit rate that you're actually selecting. But usually as a good buffer, we usually recommend um, two and a half times of what your uh, internet speed check shows up at so for example if you know you you know you only have a certain allocation let's say you only got six meg up uh, you definitely have to have uh, a bit rate that's two and a half times lower than that so maybe you wouldn't want to go over what 25 2500 to 2000 at the most if you were pushing at that depending on what your your upload speed is so um, so while Justin was looking at Facebook, I don't know if we it's had. A, it's up now. Okay, yeah. so yeah, we can go ahead and yeah, the, the transfer web, back the, to that. The web page fell asleep, so I had okay, to refresh it. No problem. So yeah, when you click on live video, there'll be a pop-up window, and it's going to default to a web camera, but we want to connect the MVS 25 to it. So uh, when I click on connect, um, oh, I want to jump back to real quick, is that um, uh, 1080i is converted to 1080p 30 frames. Um, in the MVS 25 because that's what YouTube and Facebook, oh sorry, Facebook is 720 only, but YouTube requires 1080p. It won't support interlaced video. So um, the MVS 25 will automatically handle that cross conversion for you. And so yeah, back in Facebook. Which is nice. Yeah, it is nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back in uh, Facebook, you can see here, I clicked on connect and now I have the same server URL uh, just like uh, YouTube has and then I have a stream key which I would then put in and uh, you have the option to it's a little different than YouTube so with YouTube I'm forced to reset the stream key it's just always permanent but with Facebook um, you have an option to make it permanent with use a persistent stream key and then uh, you can reset it when you want to change it or you can disable user persistent stream key and then once the video feed is going, pointing the MVS 25 to it, you can then in the corner go live and start your uh, live stream. Um, or you can schedule it ahead of time, like we do for this show. Um, I see we have a question from Sergio. Yes. Can I use the MVS 25 to encode spherical videos to YouTube 3D? Uh, no, unfortunately, the uh, MVS 25 just supports standard broadcast resolutions. Um, so uh, 3D video and anything that requires stitching uh, is not supported by MVS 25. All right, so I think we, did we kind of wrap? So we basically showed YouTube. 
Uh, we showed the setup on the encoder and we also showed uh, basically Facebook setup. Um, so I guess at this point we're just waiting for any other little questions you might have, but just to kind of give everybody a little bit of a, actually maybe we should talk about some of maybe the troubleshooting issues that maybe somebody might have when it comes to streaming, one, which one of them was definitely upload uh, bandwidth, which we kind of touched on in our, in our first episode. Uh, and what are other factors that might kind of hinder some of the stream streams when you're when you're trying to go live? Well, I definitely should cover uh, go logging into your router, and um, let me just uh, see if it was. Um, of course, it it logged us back out again because that's what a router does to try to protect itself. Yeah, it's all about security. <laughs> um, uh, one thing, if you are having trouble scanning for um, the MVS25 on the network using the IP finder, um, you could temporarily disable your antivirus and scan again and see if maybe uh, the, uh, an the f antivirus or firewall is, uh, is prohibiting you from uh, scanning for it. Oh, and you know, we have another question here. Let me go ahead and read yeah. this one. Uh, Randy is asking, what does the encoder do if your internet bandwidth momentarily drops below your bitrate setting? Does it stop? Does it keep trying? Does it scale down to a lower bitrate? So I think from that point of view, I think it'll, the, it'll slow the, the bitrate down, I believe. I don't know if it'll, it depends how bad your connection gets. So I mean, if, if you don't have any upload speed, at that point, you're probably going to lose your stream. There's probably nothing that you can do about that part of it. Part of it. But if it slows down a little bit, um, one way to combat that, actually, which we touched on in the last episode, was to use uh, quality of service uh, on your router so that if there are other devices on that same network, it won't impede the, the stream upload. You know, But obviously, if you do have some bit rate issues pushing up, I mean, the encoder can only slow down to a point, and then if it can't actually make its connection from the encoder all the way up to your CDN, then you probably would get a loss of the stream, I would think, at that point. Yeah, drop frames um, would, yeah, probably experience some drop frames um, or possibly buffering. Um, and, you know, it also depends on how the CDN handles it. Um, but yeah, if you if you know you could consider doing var variable bit rate instead of constant bit rate as well, if that's a concern. But really, more often than not, it'd be a matter of increasing your upload speed. You know, like Steven said, that two and a half times the required bandwidth rule for your upload speed is a good good starting point, a good guideline. Uh, so you might need to talk to your ISP about you know, increasing your plan's upload speed. Uh, and we touched on this in our uh, last episode. One of the, you know, one of the nice things about a lot of like residential uh, plans at this point is, you know, depending on where you are geographically, but, um, you know, at least in a lot of parts here in the U.S., uh, you're seeing about 8 to 12 megabit up on, yeah. on standard residential plans. Uh, it may vary with business plans, but check with the ISP. Um, I'm gonna take you over real quick to our router that um, our streaming network is on. So like Steve was talking about with QoS, quality of service, um, Linksys calls it media prioritization. So you can choose which devices on the network get the, uh, sh the largest share of the bandwidth um, when everything's running. And uh, if you need to um, look for the MVS25, because it's not showing up in the scanner, but you know, you're pretty sure it's on the network. Um, you can go to you know, a list of attached devices or device list on the router, and you can go through and uh, try and reverse look it up by the uh, MAC address. Which, and which, if you, uh, yeah. Oh, which, yeah. Sorry, I should interrupt you. The, the MAC address actually is actually on the bottom of the unit. Um, so all of our NVS 25s and I think most of our streaming products now have a MAC address on the bottom printed on there. So that way, if you do have to go into the device list, as Justin is showing you, uh, right. You basically you can see that uh, that MAC address, um, which is kind of like a little ID for the device. So I just wanted to go ahead and show you that. Go ahead, Justin. Yep. Sorry for interrupting. Oh yeah, it's just a there. yeah series of numbers uh, uh, separated by uh, colons, and uh, you can then if you see that MAC address, 
in the uh, list of attached devices in the router, or you could do a uh, uh, look up the ARP table using command prompt. You could, uh, for instance, um, open command prompt and then do ARP space dash A, and it will list all the devices on the network um, based on their MAC address from which you can then reverse look up the IP address. Uh, if you have more questions about that, definitely contact us in support and we can uh, provide some more details on, on how to troubleshoot finding your router um, using these alternate methods. Yeah, so basically, if you do have an actual technical question for a data video product, you should email support at datavideo.com and we'll get back to you that way. Um, Randy had one more follow-up question, uh, which is, so when the bandwidth returns, does it restart the stream or does the, the does a human basically have to uh, do something to interact with the device? And I believe the question, the, the response to that is basically, uh, if the internet, let's say it can't upload at a certain point and it's having connection uh, issues for a time being, I think the, the router will automatically kind of keep trying to push to that stream up until the bandwidth is available. So I don't think you need to actually do anything to the encoder uh, physically once once you have that, you know, that, that lull and that, you know, issues with the bandwidth. So, you know, if the bandwidth comes back up, the, the router should automatically, I mean, the encoder should automatically compensate for it, I think, at that point. Yeah, it should, uh, it should resume. I mean, I think, though, if you're down for a few minutes, um, at that point, there may be a breakdown between the CDN and the encoder, at which point you may have to manually monitor, restart yeah. it or start a new stream. Um, but that may depend on the service you're streaming to um, and other network factors. But I'd say most of the time, your, your stream will automatically recover. Okay, we had another question. Um, basically, s let's see here. Diego is asking uh, how we're actually doing two streams on Facebook and on YouTube. Actually, that's a little bit more of a sophisticated question uh, on our setup for this actual live streaming event. What we're actually doing is we actually have another software product that's a cloud-based product uh, that allows you to um, handle multiple streams and you can actually push the streams to various locations. So. What we're doing here today, which is a little, little bit of a uh, more advanced setup, which we can cover maybe a future episode, uh, we're basically taking the URL from the encoder and we're pushing it to our DBS 200, which is uh, basically our, our streaming encoder product, uh, or more of a software product. But basically, it goes from there, and then we're actually pushing the stream to individually to Facebook and individually to YouTube Live. So that's actually how we're, we're doing that today. So if you were a customer and you purchased this, at least initially just to do a basic stream, um, it's only gonna go to one point at a time. You, you can't actually split it to go to two different locations, but we do have a solution for that. So I just wanted to kind of answer um, that portion of it. Um, let's see here. The other nice thing about the DVS software is that it uh, will allow you to transcode the encode you send to it. So this is a single encoder unicast device. It's doing the RTMP push to the server. And say you want to send 1080p to DVS 200. It's 6 megabit. You can then split it off to Facebook, have that be 720p 4 megabit. So you can have two different quality streams, one going to each service for the simulcast. All right, so that was a great question. Um, I think, unless we see any other questions, I think we'll probably wrap up this episode. So we're basically looking for any, any suggestions that you might have for future episodes. We're kind of thinking about possibly doing the next one on a slightly different topic, but we'll release that later. Um, and we'll make some announcements on that. Um, I also wanted to kind of reiterate that w w the nice thing about it is we are doing all this streaming and the switching and the CG is all done on data video products, um, which is kind of nice uh, for us to be able to utilize our products in that way. I know a lot of times we, we deal with customers that, that are setting this, this stuff up and, and we help them get, get it going, but it's nice to actually utilize our equipment to actually do a live stream so we can show you 
step by step how to do something. Um, and what else did we want to kind of touch on? So basically, thank you for joining us. Um, remember to go ahead and like us on Facebook, uh, follow us on, uh, on uh, YouTube, and um, we're also on Instagram and Twitter as well. So uh, I think that about wraps up this, uh, this are there any, episode. Are there any, any other, other questions that may be? Well, I think, I think we have one more. Okay. Just wanna Let's go to one. one. So we're from uh, Spence here. Okay. First off, thank you for your compliment. And um, yeah, so regarding the dual streams, it's kind of what we were touching on earlier with DVS. Um, all you need is what you saw on this table, and then the DVS 200 is cloud software that you can install. Um, and we have a whole video and a guide and additional information about that um, on our website. And if you want some helpful links to get you started, just contact us in support or at Tech Corner, and we'll get you going with that. Um, and then from there, you just set up the software to um, output the uh, the encoder feed to the to you know Facebook Live and YouTube at the same time, or at, you know Daycast or any other service that you'd be you know using for that. Yeah, and I think we have one other customer that's maybe having some setup questions on setting up maybe a decoder, but I think we can probably answer that one in more detail offline because uh, it kind of strays a little bit um, from this subject but uh, I think that's I think that about wraps it up so thank you for joining us for this uh, this episode of Tech Corner again my name is Steven this is Justin and uh, thank you for watching we'll see you next time bye bye